Hey, good afternoon. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Let's talk about rope. It's mid-November, and I'm out by the wood stove in the shop working on my truck, my tree truck. We got tools. We got destroyed wheel bearings and brakes. We got lots of new goodies to put on the tree truck. Welcome to Renaissance Acres. So we'll go over here to the rope bay and plug into the old tripod here and see how this works. Plug in the power so that we don't run out of juice. Let's see how that works. Hello? Anybody in there? Hi, I'm Mark, Renaissance Acres Tree Care, Fids and Fibers, and the Growth Ring. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be asked to talk with you all today about rope and the state of splicing in the arborist world in 2020 uh, during COVID. Uh, wear my chicken hat for good luck. I much prefer to be in person with everyone. I'm much better when I can actually see and feel and converse and get the feedback from everybody. So uh, forgive me if I go off on tangents, I'll try to reel myself back in and get back to where we were. We'll see how well I do. This could be the incoherent ramblings of a madman, but I'll try not to take up more than an hour of your time I'm used to teaching 14 hour days. So consider yourself lucky. We'll get out of here with 45 minutes to an hour. Um, let's see. So the ISA asked me to do a talk. I was originally gonna do a talk on the growth ring, which is our safety training program, but I felt like that was too personal and I needed to be in, in space, with the same space with everybody else. So. Uh, we settled on the state of the art of splicing in 2020 for the arborist world during COVID-19. And um, I'm actually really happy to be talking about this because this lines up with uh, another one of the initiatives I, I'm working on. Uh, and I'll talk about that later. But um, so the topic today is splicing. For those of you who know me, I'm Mark, I teach the Fids and Fibers workshops since 2008. Um, I've been an arborist since the year 2000, so I'm getting a little long in the tooth for this business, but uh, I've seen a couple things and I'd like to share them with you. Um, today's goal is to talk about the state of splicing, where it's been, like the history of splicing a little bit, uh, what's going on right now in splicing, uh, in the industry, how things are, are kind of beginning to morph and change and where things could be headed. And so like, if we allow one path to go like this, you could end up here, but if we change, we could end up here. And we just have to decide where we want to end up. So this might be just about giving you some food for thought about making choices going to, uh, forward as to how we want the industry to be. Typically when I teach a workshop, the first thing we do is I have everybody take their shoes and socks off. We ground to the floor. We do a guided meditation. I burn some sage and we do a tree poem or something like that. For today, since we're not going to be in that proximity, um, I wanted to do a little bit of a gratitude. I wanted to say thank you uh, to the ISA for starters for having me here. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the arborists around the world who have uh, asked me questions, listened to the answers, uh, come to me for guidance, uh, and shown interest in the stuff that I'm doing. So I'm super grateful for that. Um, but I also wanted to say thanks to uh, the people that got me here because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And some of those giants are people like Stanley Longstaff, who was a splicer in our industry before I got here. I never got a chance to meet Stanley. But Stanley had a profound effect 
on me and my perception of rope and my ability to splice because he affected so many people in New England who I come in contact with and bouncing back at me is the stuff that Stanley taught them. So Jim Fiorentino, the fabulous splicer for Shelter Tree, uh, he's been a mentor and a guide to me uh, that learned directly from Stanley. Uh, thank you, Jim. And then also, um, Stanley, since Stanley has passed away, um, there's also someone else who's passed away recently, Brian Toss, who um, I had a relationship with Brian from each end of the country. He would dial in by Skype and talk to my Fids and Fibers workshops, and then he and I would talk offline from those. And I met Brian through Tree Buzz, back when Tree Buzz was the thing. You know, we weren't doing these types of conferences. We didn't have social media all day, but we had Tree Buzz to go home to every night. And, uh, you know, thanks to Tom Dunlap and Mark Chisholm for supporting Tree Buzz, coming up with that brainchild and maintaining it for all these years. That allowed me to come in contact with Brian. And Brian took time out of his day for decades to guide us arborists gently towards the path of strength and consistency and ethics and integrity and kindness and thoughtfulness and truth in brake testing. Um, so rest in peace, Stanley. Rest in peace, Brian. Thank you for uh, helping guide myself and others uh, to where we are today. A few other people I'm grateful for in my life are Rich Hattier uh, and Michael House Tain for teaching me how to splice originally. Um, and then later on, people like Naughty um, and Jason Deal and Octavius Benton uh, for giving me hands-on pointers and, and philosophical uh, ways of thinking. I'm so grateful for them because they set the stage for where I'm headed in my future. And finally, in, under gratitudes, I'd like to thank Samson Rope, Yale Cordage, and New England Ropes. When I first started splicing, those three companies were the ones that were really putting out information about splicing, talking about brake testing, giving us an opportunity to tear their ropes apart. And when I started doing FIDS and Fibers, they began supporting FIDS and Fibers by sending fiber to the students so that we could tear it apart, learn how it worked. And that is invaluable. So the 2,500 students I've had, uh, or more, I'm not exactly sure, um, have all had an opportunity to rip ropes apart, see how they're made, understand what tapers are, understand you know, how much a berry is and what coefficient of friction means and what's class one and class two. And without their support, I couldn't have spent that time with the students giving that information to students, but also receiving that back. Because every time I teach something, I learn in the process of the teaching. Like I, when I say something to a student and I watch how the light bulb clicks on or how it doesn't and we work it through, it gives me a new perspective on how to teach it the next time or what I'm actually, helps me understand what I'm actually saying if I'm just regurgitating something and it helps me hold on to it. Um, new England Ropes has since been uh, transformed into Tufelberger uh, Fiber Corporation and uh, Tufelberger continues to support Fids and Fibers just as New England Ropes did and I'm super grateful for Tufelberger also. All the rope companies have been supportive of us. But when I look back at the beginnings uh, and how I was able to leapfrog to a place where I had some understanding, these are the people I'm super grateful for. So for a moment, in your chair, wherever you are, I'd like you to think about someone upon whose shoulders you stand. Someone who gave you a leg up, someone who believed in you, that, um, that allowed you to come to a greater, deeper understanding. So just for a minute, I'd just like to give you a second to think about that. And as you do, maybe put a smile on your face just to say thanks for those people. All right. Thanks for doing that with me. I appreciate it. Um, 
So let's jump right into the history. And I have written down here, what was splicing? Well, splicing is ancient. Uh, it goes back to the very first vines that, you know, early man climbed, you know, uh, and then they decided they needed a longer one. So they kind of tied it together in some fashion. They, they took the fibers and did something. And when the Phoenicians came up with three strand rope made out of reeds twisted, they began to put an eye in that or to, 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 to repair a rope or to repair a net. And it, so it goes back into our DNA. It's, a, it's an old craft and it was often kind of like witchcraft. It was kind of closely guarded secret. Um, there was always a splicing guy, a rope guy on the ship and they had an apprentice and he was the one that was charged with making sure the ropes were appropriate. They were, they were well kept, they were spliced correctly, they were the right length, they were inspected and stored properly. Um, and that was kind of a magician's trick in a way, tying these arcane knots and such. It was a seafaring ordeal. It wasn't until much later that arborists started climbing trees uh, with rope. They started climbing them without it at first, using tools, falling out. Then they said, maybe I should use a rope. So we had some three-strand rope. And you look back at the old black and white photographs that we have, the TCIA posts, um, or the ISA puts together, you know, these guys on three-strand rope, you know, tied in this crazy harness and et cetera. It wasn't until the 1950s when plastics started being formed after World War II uh, using the excess oil that was left from the war. They started refining plastics and polyester and that's when synthetic ropes kind of came into being. And ropes took a big leap forward from the natural fibers that we had. And then in the probably late 50s, early 60s, Samson was the first that I know of that came up with the, uh, the 16 strand with the parallel core, which became later on our, our workhorse climbing line from starting in the 70s through the 80s into the 90s, that 16 strand was the workhorse. And it was the magic of that arborist splice that allowed that big five inch girth hitchable eye to carabiners. And then later on, uh, in uh, 1999, 2000, we started fooling around with the tight eye in that splice uh, and learning that it would, it would still keep the strength in a tight eye. So what was splicing? Well, at that time, it was a small, dedicated cadre of rope geeks, people that passed information between each other. There was no internet. It was in-person teaching, hands-on, um, being passed from person to person, and it was kind of closely kept. Um, it wasn't until Samson started publishing the Samson splicing manual to get their products more in wider use, to, to more useful to more people, that um, you know, splicing started to like break out of that little cloistered environment. So in 2008, uh, Rich Hattier, who what I, I think Rich is one of the visionaries of our industry, he had the foresight to create the Splicing Symposium with uh, John Hartenberg, Michael Tain, Michael House Tain, um, Octavius Benton, down in Kentucky at the old ABR facility. Rich brought, you know, 40, 50 people together and spliced and taught us how to splice. And that to me was an eye opener. That was the time when I, when I was starting to look at how splicing penetrates the industry, how many people are using splices. And in conversations with Rich back then, he thought it was like three to 5% of arborists were using splices. And I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, how come so few? because splices seem superior to knots in so many ways. Of course, knots have their place in certain situations and they're, they're irreplaceable, but splices are amazing to use in certain situations. And I couldn't believe that they weren't more widely accepted. But that's where the mystery and the cloistered 
nature of the teaching kind of came in. And when Rich brought us in, people from all over the country and the world came in to learn from Rich, and then they all went away. I was one of them. And I got so turned on that I actually started teaching FIDS and Fibers the very next year. Um, So I guess where I'm at is what was splicing? Splicing was a contained place where it was a one-to-one -one relationship. If you had a splice, it was because you knew the splicer. You know, think back to yourself, raise your hands or whatever, uh, to people who remember getting a splice from Rich or from Michael or from Corey or from Jason um, back in the day, you know, when uh, maybe Norm or even Nick, you know, when you got handed that splice uh, from one of the few people that knew how to do it. Um, so it was a special thing. These days, here in 2020, splices are much more ubiquitous. But I would still say that splices are only penetrating the industry about 15%. Um, there are still a, a vast majority of people out there who are not climbing on splices, who are still tying their hitches uh, tying their termination knots. Uh, and I think there's a lot of room for splicing to grow. Um, so what is splicing today? Well, things have changed a little bit. We have more arborist companies, more arborist supply shops to choose from. The internet has been great at allowing businesses to open up, advertise, and get the product out there. A lot of them start out just selling gear and then they start splicing and they all run into the same issues. Uh, quantity, manpower, quality, um, turnover. Uh, and so we're seeing companies struggling to get at 15% saturation in the market for splices we're seeing some companies struggling to get splices out the door at that volume if the internet helps and i think it's going to turn the splicing market on then the request the demand for splices is going to far outstrip the supply of splices and that's where we are right now i believe that um we could put a lot more splices out there and they would sell like hotcakes off the shelves. There aren't splices sitting around waiting to be sold. Um, so we have a couple different ways that splices hit the market. One is the manufacturer splices. So like Yale Cordage will splice and give it to the end user, sell it to a company which gets it to the end user. We have uh, companies that all they do is splice, like at height, uh, fantastic, high quality, detail oriented, OCD type company that, you know, everything is, is nuts on and all they do is splicing. They really focus on that and they, they, uh, they excel at it. And then we have also Arbor supply shops that are doing their own in-house splicing and selling that to their customers. Now, all three of these methods work. They all have, um, pluses and minuses, and I won't go into detail about everything, but uh, I'm actually interested in the way that things are changing now for Arborist Supply Shops. Um, the one-to-one -one relationship that we used to enjoy, the like when, when Rich gave me a splice, I trusted Rich, Rich's reputation and knowledge, and I could climb on that splice um, with confidence and trust. Um, these days, we're, we're changing that a little bit. You don't know who's splicing for you. You may not have ever heard of that person. You may not have ever seen that person. That person doesn't know who you are. That person might not even be a climber. It may not even be an arborist. As a matter of fact, probably has never climbed a rope or used a lanyard, or installed a friction saver. Yet, you would be purchasing an item from a trusted arborist supply house as if, in the old days, it was a one-to-one -one relationship. 
that's a big change. It's a big shift uh, in in philosophy. It's a big shift in mechanics and methodology. And because as human beings, our perspective is often very small. So someone new coming into the industry today looks at how things are and says, this is how they are, that's how they've always been. Whereas someone like Tom Dunlap or Mark Chisholm or Melissa Levangi, uh, Norm Hall, Dennis Ryan, who've been with us for many, many years, we see how it was, what it's changed, and we, we get all the progressions, and then we see where it is right now. But whether you're new or whether you're old, a lot of times it's harder to look into the future and see what's going to happen. So the idea behind this talk today is to talk about where are we headed and where do we want to be. <coughs> so let's see. Uh, what is splicing now? So let's talk about what is splicing now. There are some terms that are more accepted and used now than they were 20 years ago when I first started. Things like break testing, things like recipes, um, labeling, insurance, um, repeatability. These are all concepts that are starting to like be spoken of. Because with the advent of social media, now if someone has a poorly spliced product, let's see if I have something here. Let's say, uh, let's say that this product arrived brand new from the factory and, um, you know, it looked a little bit funny. It looked odd. It was strange in some way. Well, the first thing people do is take out their smartphone, take a picture of it and post it on the internet and say, Hey, what do you guys think of this? And the guys and gals on the internet chime in and say this, what they know. A lot of times what they know is wrong. A lot of times what they know is correct. It's a, it's a melange. It's a, just a grouping of opinions. Um, and through time, Usually the, the correct answer or the truth gets teased out and exposed. Um, our arborists today are more informed than our arborists of 20 years ago. And our arborists of tomorrow are going to be even more well informed than the arborists of today. So what is the future of splicing? Um, I'm going to talk about this in more detail a little bit, but... I think the future of splicing is going to be transparency. Um, it's going to be standardization and transparency. Because asking someone to commit their life to a item um, is a lot to ask. And then having them pay for it is a lot to ask. Um, Let's see. I want to talk about the difference between splicing instructions and sewing instructions, just so you have a, uh, an interesting perspective in that. So if someone asks how to, what's a good recipe for class one double braid to, to splice a rigging rope, let's say. We want to splice this rigging rope, put a, put a nice eye on that rigging rope. Well, the instructions for that are very well known. And we can point to any one of a dozen locations on the internet that will give you specific instructions to create the class one double braid splice. However, Yale Cordage, since this is a Yale Cordage rope, Yale Cordage would have the minute details to make this splice uh, 100%, okay? Now, that information is freely available, and people share it all the time. And it's been that way for the past 20 years. But, for instance, if you had a sewing machine and you asked on the internet, hey, how do I sew this? Well, you won't get an answer. And the reason is, 
is that to sew one of these, it takes a sew, an expensive sewing machine, somewhere between forty and sixty thousand dollars, and it takes about six months to a year of testing. Sew it, break test, sew it, break test. Changing things like the thread diameter, the amount of wax on the thread, the amount of tension in the thread, the amount of clamping force in the piece, the length of the stitches, how many passes that you do. Now, when a company spends let's say forty or sixty thousand dollars on a machine and then another forty thousand dollars on payroll and then another fifty thousand dollars in brake test and materials to come up with this so it's their intellectual capital they are not currently sharing that on the internet so sewn splices are not as well known there are some people talking about hand sewing them we're gonna push that off the table because of the repeatability factor that's not something that that I want to even, I'm not going to promote it, I'm, I'm not going to yell at people for doing it, but I'm certainly not going to engage in the conversation about it because it's not repeatable uh, in quantity. A sewing machine is the way to do it. However, we have these two situations where the information on how to do a splice is freely available and the information on how to do a sewn termination is not freely available. So we're evolving. This didn't exist 20 years ago. This is brand new. Now, I mentioned intellectual capital. Well, back in the day when there was 16 strand rope and then maybe a three strand lanyard with a prussic on it, there were about three splices involved in an arboriculture. It was very simple. A three strand splice, a 12 strand splice, and a 16 strand splice. And then Every now and then someone wanted a double braid splice. So maybe four, four possible splices, um, very few products. But now when you go around to the different Arborist supply shop websites, you will find anywhere between 150 and 300 individual SKUs, individual products that they make out of rope for our needs because no two of us is alike we all want something different. We all want a different color. We all want a different length. We all want a different shape, a different eye. And there's so many configurations to so many things that there are 150 to 300 different products for any Arborist supply shop. Now that becomes intellectual capital just due to sheer quantity. Um, all right. So you can see where the future's going. It came from a very simple background to kind of where it is today is this evolving place. And then the future is going to be evolving more rapidly with more, um, more permutations. Um, now might be a good time to mention something like the SP life program or manufacturers like, uh, Courant or Cousin Trestec, um, who are making, uh, terminations that fit through certain devices and so they're taking splices and rope configurations that maybe didn't exist or well-known splices for particular ropes and trying to change the instructions to allow them to fit through devices now that brings a whole host of another issues because now we don't have a, a large body of testing um, meeting a threshold meeting a certain threshold of 5400 in the US uh, we don't have that large body of, of information to rely on again. So whenever we're in a situation where we have a flashlight and we're kind of looking around to see where we're going with that. We'll see how that all plays out. Um, and not to be, I don't want to sound as if I'm not high on the SP Life program because I am. I like what they've done. They've codified some, some rope splices with TUV to show some consistency, some standardization, and they're gonna, they're trying to impose uh, some best management practices that shouldn't be deviated from, and I love the, the way that they're doing it. So, um, thumbs up to Tufelberger for this program. I'm excited to see how it all plays out over the next year, five years, 10 years. We'll see where this is all going. So, we talked about history. What I'd also like to talk about now is, for those of you in America, I'd like to talk about the ANSI Z133. 
For those of you from Europe and around the world, um, I'm sure you've heard of the ANSI Z. Um, please don't take my uh, remarks as being exclusionary. I'm more familiar with the Z and less familiar with your standards. So I'm going to point out some of the stuff about the Z. If you could um, make some analogies to what I'm reading in the Z and what I'm talking about, and then teach me how it works in your standard and what's happening, um, I would love to learn that. So I think we, I think there might be a question and answer period or a text uh, reply to question period at some point. Um, we'll see how that goes. But if not, you can find me on the web. I'm all over the place and I'd love to hear from you. Friend me on Facebook, find me on Instagram. Um, yeah, please, please. So let's see. Let me touch a couple more things that it looks like I've skipped here. Uh, I'd like to say out loud that splices are hard to police. So I've been teaching splicing for 12 years now, and I tell my students that they are not allowed to splice ropes and sell their products. Absolutely not. Um, they need to have insurance in order to do that. That's the very basic minimum. And some of my students, very few, I'd say one or two percent, have gone off to try to sell their splices and I've admonished them and some it works, some it doesn't. 99.9% .9 of my splicers don't go on to splice anymore. What they do is they are able to do gear inspection. They're much more qualified for gear inspection. So when they, when they feel a splice such as this one, this is a 10X hitch cord with a crossover in the center and when they run their hand over that they can actually now feel what all the parts are inside and how they're supposed to be working and they can inspect the whipping and they can expect the splices and the connection points and they can look for abrasion and they know what they're looking for because they spent time in a class learning uh, from fids and fibers but splicing is generally hard to police because arborists are inherently rebels. Let's face it. Uh, they're rule breakers and they're very independent. Um, and if they think they can save some money, they'll do it. So um, what I'd like to do is get in front of our natural inc inclinations and be our better angels with what we'll talk about later. Um, the same thing about arborists is that if uh, they want to do it themselves, but if the community gets wind of an unsafe manufacturer, <whistles> yikes, all hell breaks loose. And um, I would say that arborists can be pretty hypocritical. Uh, sometimes we come down like a bucket of bolts on someone else when we've done something similar. And uh, I know that I've had to check myself on that a few times, and I know a few people that also do. Um, Here's a quote from Aristotle that I put up in all my workshops that I'd like to mention in, turn, in, in regards to splicing. He says, excellence, therefore, is not a single act, but a habit. We are what we repeatedly do. And so when it comes to splicing, I feel this way. If someone can do a splice once during a class or with supervision or with friends and complete the splice, that doesn't make them a splicer. Having repeatable break tests that break above the standard that they're expecting and constantly honing your skills and your tools and your recipes and your language makes someone a splicer. All right, another thing that I kind of skipped over was Arborist supply shops, when they buy spools of rope in, uh, they're buying from a manufacturer. The minute that they take the rope off that spool and break into it, they become a manufacturer themselves. The original manufacturer, in my opinion, 
ceases to be responsible for that piece of rope once it's cut and pulled apart and reformed into a tool. And this is something that the SP Life program has actually said out loud. There's been some talk about it uh, in the background and stuff, but um, the SP Life program has kind of said, you become a manufacturer. And I'm grateful to them because I think it's absolutely true. And I think we as an industry need to begin changing our, um, our nomenclature, changing our vocabulary and our understanding to say yes, um, so and so that sells arborist supplies and does splicing is now a manufacturer of those tools. Um, so here's some thoughts on a splicer. A splicer must have repeatability built into their repertoire. A splicer must have periodic break tests to ensure their ability to follow instructions and ensure that the rope manufacturer's consistent quality is in place, uh, both workmanship and materials, because uh, now sometimes materials are moving from made in the USA to made offshore, and do they react the same? Well, we have to learn that. Uh, a splicer must stand behind their work with both labels and insurance. Um, let's see. I guess we'll talk about labels now. Mark Bridge did a really nice uh, write-up on labels, and Jason Deal also did a write-up on labels. Jason did his in the ISA um, magazine, and Mark Bridge did his on the Tufelberger on the um, Tree Imagineers blog uh, about labels. And I think it's time to update both those conversations uh, to go into the future. But um, I've seen. A lot of stuff go on with labels over the past 10 years. I've seen, um, I've seen the same product with different labels on it from different companies. And if I take three or four different companies who splice, uh, let's say, Beeline or, or uh, Ocean Polyester or 10X, each label will be different. One will say, meets ANSI Z133.1. Sounds great, but what does it mean? We'll talk about that in a minute. Another one says 5,400 pounds. Another one says to be used in basket configuration with a line with two arrows at the end. Uh, another one says fit for purpose. And another one says an actual break test value. But they're all being sold and they're very confusing in my opinion. I think they should all say the same thing. Um, Sometimes they mix uh, European standards with American standards. I see CE mixed with ANSI. Um, the wordsmithing to meet marketing demands, I find, is, is going to be dangerous in the future. We need to curb this now before it gets out of hand. And um, my next topic is the ANSI Z. And what I'd like to say right out front is I would like to get a seat on the ANSI subcommittee for cordage because I want to help fix it. I don't want to call out the ANSI Z and then say, oh, it's your problem. You guys fix it and just keep, you know, stomping my feet. I actually want to jump in the ring and, and fix it. So if there's anybody on the Z committee that wants to have some help or wants to uh, put me, you know, put my feet to the fire, Please call me. I'd like to join the committee, uh, subcommittee on cordage, please. Um, first of all, I'd like to say the ANSI Z is outdated. We're going to go through some of the sections of the Z. Um, this is what it looks like for those of you who don't have a copy. This is the uh, 2017 revision. And in section 8.2.1, we have this uh, wonderful sentence here. Climbing lines used in a split tail system and split tails shall be terminated with an eye splice or a knot that interfaces appropriately with the connecting link. When using a carabiner without a captive eye, the termination selected shall maintain loading along major axis the connection between carabiners and terminated rope ends shall be compatible to limit the possibility of accidental disconnection or minor axis loading of carabiners. Well, 
That's great. I love what it's trying to say, but it's time to update the split tail references or to include other references. Um, Eight point two point three. It says arborist saddles and work positioning lanyards shall not be altered in a manner in a manner that would compromise the integrity of the equipment. And I wrote down uh, what does it mean to follow this edict? What about bridges? Um, should we be using bridges, uh, bridge material that didn't come with the saddle? Shouldn't it say that in the Z? Um, what about folks that make their own lanyard uh, with knots, uh, seeing as how knots reduce the strength of ropes by 50 to 60 percent and splices retain 80 to 90 to 100 percent of the rope? Does that, how does that fit in with this sentence? I think we need to craft this a little bit differently. Um, and if you make your own lanyard, um, sh should there not be testing? Shouldn't you make three lanyards or five lanyards and brake test three of them to prove that they all pass spec before you use it and then have that documentation uh, in your company's uh, uh, documented you know, safety files? Uh, I believe that's true. Um, for those of you who follow climbingarborist.com, uh, Dan just did a wonderful interview with Ryan Seneschal from Victoria, BC. We lost a, a climber uh, this last week, and the conversation that Dan and Ryan have about that, uh, Ryan really does a wonderful job illuminating what type of documentation you need to have in your files. And I think the Z should match up with, with how that should, should be done. Um, section 8.2.4. All right. It says that ropes should have uh, a breaking strength, a minimum break strength of 5,400 pounds when new. And I challenge anyone out there to think about why that number exists, where that number came from. And the reason I want to open this conversation is, is that there's two different um, standards. There's a European standard and the U.S. standard. And the two minimum brake strengths are different, but we're still putting live people up in Europe with a lower brake strength than we are in America. I would like to figure out a way to have a conversation to merge both those standards. I know it's pie in the sky and I know this group is probably falling out of your chairs laughing at this point, but I think it's time that we start thinking about it. The time we start talking about it, we, we try to find some common ground to move this ball forward. We don't need to have two standards on this globe because human beings all have the same physical bone structure, muscle structure, and we're subjected to the same forces in, in similar trees. And I'd like to um, make our safety regulations as simple as possible so that we can push them out over the whole world as opposed to having different arcane bits and pieces in different places. Um, is that too much to ask? I don't know. We'll see. Um, when it comes to the 18KN European standard, uh, it's not just rope, it's hardware. We're seeing um, hardware connecting links and different pieces bleed into the U.S. and ropes bleed into the U.S. that are okay in Europe but are now in use in America. Um, I'd like it to be that people are not being hypocrites when they use it. I'd like it to be equal on some level. And um, let's see here. 8.2.6, prussic loops. This has long been a sticking point for me. Uh, split tails, Doubled hitch cords and work positioning lanyards used in a climbing system shall meet the minimum breaking strength of 5,400 pounds. Hitch cords, prussic loops, and split tails shall be manufactured from materials suitably resistant to abrasion and temperatures experienced 
during work and rescue scenarios. I'm good with that. But the first part where it says, shall meet the minimum breaking strength of 5,400 pounds. To me, this is wide open and this is where labels really diverge. When you see a hitch cord, you see a label on a hitch cord that has a line with an arrow on each end and it says doubled for doubled configuration use. And then it says 5,400 pounds. Does that mean that they tested it doubled or they tested it in a single pull? And if it applies to lanyards as well, it should, like, if it's going to say hitch cords and lanyards, it should be the same. Everything should be tested in a straight pull. And we should put a number on it that actually makes sense instead of this blanket 5,400 pounds, which there are hitch cords out there that don't meet in a straight pull. So now they're saying, well, we'll put it in a doubled configuration. We'll double the strength of it. So now it could be half the strength of 5,400 pounds. And because they're pulling it in a doubled configuration, they're skirting that that um, regulation. I'm not sure how we're enforcing it. I don't know who's stopping anyone from doing that or who is clarifying this to make it better. Um, 8.2.11. This one is wonderful. This is splicing shall be done in accordance with manufacturer specifications. There are a lot of ropes out there that don't have any manufacturer specifications for splicing. And there are some that uh, have very poor uh, instructions where they don't yield full strength. Um, There also is no teeth to that. How do you prove it? You can say, is this spliced to manufacturer specifications? Yes. Does it have any label? No. Can it be used? I use it in my tree service, and I'm sure a lot of people are using it in their tree service, but we don't have any guidelines to follow. There are manufacturers or arborist supply shops out there that I've seen their products on their shelves at trade shows that are done the exact opposite way of how the manufacturer asks it to be done yet they're still labeled and being sold but there's no one to police it um, I think we need more verbiage I think we need uh, to take a deeper look at splicing I've actually heard people on the internet say that since a knot loses 50 or 60% of the strength of the rope, that a splice that meets 50 or 60% of the strength of the splice is legal because it's the same as a knot. And um, I'd like to clear that up and say, no, a splice should meet a threshold. It's 90% to 100% of the strength of the rope if it's done efficiently. Um, and then let the manufacturers come up with the splice instructions to make that happen repeatedly, repeatably. So, uh, I don't know what the European standards are and how airtight or how many loopholes there are in them, but I feel like there are a bunch in the United States and I'd like to start to work on those. Um, I'd like to skip ahead now to the FIDS and Fibers perspective, which is a unique, gives me a unique position to sit and, and observe from. Um, since 2008, I've been teaching the annual retreat, which uh, has grown from uh, one day to three days to five days, um, and has grown from three people to five to 10 to 25 to 30 people. And then in 2015, I started teaching Fids and Fibers on the road, where I teach groups of 20 at a time uh, there are 45 international locations on my board in the house that I'm waiting to schedule uh, until after COVID is over. So I know that there's lots and lots of interest. Uh, in 2020, I canceled 20 workshops all over the U.S. 
and then uh, the Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia uh, areas. And then for this coming spring, I was supposed to do an Asian tour, which is definitely off the hook, for, off, off the charts for right now. Um, and the annual retreat for 2021, which is gonna be in February, I'm gonna be canceling that soon. So this is the first word I've said it publicly, but I'll be canceling that because COVID is just out of control. So in, in talking with rope companies, setting up all these workshops, and then the hours and hours and hours of preparation and the hours and hours and hours of teaching and the hours and hours of post-game uh, breakdown what worked, what didn't, and, and refining the recipes and refining the teaching schedules and refining the agendas, um, and then talking with people about rope and their experience with rope. Um, what have I learned? I've learned that arborists in general know very little about rope and very little about gear inspection when it comes to fiber. And it doesn't take much for them to defer to someone who thinks they have more information. So what happens is a student will come to Fids and Fibers and they'll tear apart rope and we'll talk about it for uh, 28 hours for the two day workshop. We teach two 14 hour days. Then they go back to their company or back to their local tree climbing competition. And because they've been through that course, they realize that they know more about rope than a lot of the people that they're interfacing with and they become the de facto rope expert in the area. And then if they can't answer the question, they'll take a photo and send it to me, and then I can help them determine what to do with the piece, if it's frayed or has some cuts in it, or it has a bad taper or whatever. Um, um, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh, that, that I learned that they have very little uh, gear inspection knowledge. But what I've found is that I get letters and emails and texts all the time saying, thank you for teaching me how to do this. This is a picture of our latest gear inspection and all the stuff we cut up and took out of service. And that tells me that we're on the right track. I would say that, again, 99% of my students don't go on to splice again. Um, everybody wants to splice till they find out how difficult it is. Um, let's see. All right. Because I've been immersed in this world, I'm watching how things are happening with the Arbor supply shops that I teach at. And what's happening is those folks are now starting to start their own splicing um, departments. And they're calling me for advice on how to do it. How do, if I want to start doing this, how do I start doing it? And I, I we talk about the same things over and over again. We talk about insurance, we talk about recipes, we talk about brake testing. Um, and that leads me into this area of changes in splicing, splicers, and culture. So as more companies get into splicing, we're seeing changes in the quantity, the quality, and the leadership, and the workers that are performing splices. So we have large companies that are being bought by um, uh, more corporate financial investment houses that own arborist supply shops that underneath there there's a splicing company or a splicing entity now in the old days when it was a one-to-one -one relationship between me and my splicer this person that spliced goods for me to use there was this level of trust and understanding and feedback but now with this corporate structure where we have a financial company owning the Arbor supply shop who has the ultimate um, responsibility they're often now creating another entity another business that is going to be responsible for the splices and that's the entity that owns the insurance so now we're three steps removed from the ultimate responsible people and what happens is is that what goes on in the splice shop is hidden from view of the management of the Arborist Supply Company and also hidden from view of the company that owns the Arborist Supply Company. So now we have this situation where the, 
the bean counters, as it were, are looking for return on investment for owning this small business entity. And what I think is going to happen, because splices have not changed price in 20 years since I've been in the industry, uh, splices were 25 bucks in the year 2000. They're still 25 bucks. I believe that it won't be long before the bean counters are taking a look at how the different entities under them are performing and the splice shop prices are going to go up and the quality control is going to be squeezed a little bit to save cost. So there's going to be cost saving measures put in and increase in price coming out. And that's pulling something apart that I believe should not be pulled apart. I believe that this is life support and we should be investing more in it, not less. And I believe that it's going to be a very hard sell to teach the corporate bean counter up here, the accountant, the CFO, about what it is that these people are actually making and getting them to invest in training and break testing and documentation. And so our future, when I talked about what is the future of splicing, I believe that we're, we're on a, a path here. We, we, if we allow the current situation to go the way it's going, I believe that these corporate entities are going to begin piecemealing that part and, and then trying to take more from it, which is the way capitalism works. If we allow that to happen, that's the path we end up on. And I believe that that path is going to lead to injuries. I believe it's gonna, it's gonna lead to malformed splices leaving splicing shops all over the country. It's not gonna happen tomorrow. I don't, I'm not saying that we're having an epidemic. No one's falling out of trees. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that with 150 to 300 products in a catalog, as the as it's as a business entity gets squeezed for resources um, to try to justify its existence and then the prices go up the price of splices will go up and the quality will go down and that's that path and i don't want to go down that path what i want to do is i want to go down this other path and this path is one where um, Splicing shops have a qualified splicer program that they all adhere to, it's a standard across the industry. And that standard will do a few things. It'll, have, it'll make sure that that entity, whether it's the small arborist supply shop doing it themselves or the separated entity of the larger arborist supply shop with the company that does splices, uh, they have insurance they have standardized labels with other companies in the industry because it's life support. It's not a marketing tool. It's, it's a label about life support so an end user can understand it. They should all have recipes for each one of their products, unique recipes for each one of their products. And they should have a test result that gets attached to every recipe. So if there's a master book, that says, These are, this is our intellectual capital. So this is Fids and Fibers intellectual capital. This is uh, 150 or 300 splicing recipes from all different manufacturers for all different products, all different tools, all different configurations. Behind every one of those recipes is a break test result to prove that that recipe passes above spec. And that spec is 90% of the ropes uh, original break strength, minimum break strength. And then in the setting of the business, that that's the corporate um, intellectual capital. Now, when a new splicer comes in, because new splicers are going to be coming in all the time because demand, remember, is going through the roof. A new splicer comes in, they get a photocopy of that recipe and they get taught that recipe. Then they send out their break test results. Their break test results come back and, and go in behind their recipe. Now that splicer is qualified to do that splice, one out of 300. They need to do a recipe and a test for everything that they get asked to splice. And then that splicer's 
um, identification number should be on the label. And that should be industry-wide, that we should be able to pick any splice out of the field and find out what company did it, what splicer did it, and work our way back to find out when it was done, who did it, and whether or not they had a recipe and a break test result to back it up. That's the way to, to go down this other path where there's safety built in. And we're, we're, we're using splicing as a professional um, a tool to, to perform our work instead of having it be a return on investment type thing where we're gonna chisel away at, at what the inputs are and then take more out of it, squeeze the people in the middle, and then the quality goes downhill. I know I'm getting kind of long-winded, but I'm really passionate about this. Um, my, my perspective has been shaped by the people who taught me and my access to the companies that I've worked with and the students that I've had a chance to teach. And by looking at all those different things, I've come to this conclusion that we're on a, on a path now toward some trouble and I want to bypass it. I want to go a different route. So I invite arborist supply companies, um, companies that own arborist supply companies, splicing companies, or companies that are interested in, in getting into splicing, even if you are a tree service and you want to begin doing your own splicing, I encourage you to contact me to, to become a part of this network. So what I've created is uh, this FIDS and Fibers Qualified Splicer Program that I hope will be a voluntary, that people, that companies will want to become a part of and have a, be a voluntarily a part of it. There'll be a cost to it because we have to pay for websites, we have to pay for administrative costs and travel and all that stuff. But I don't want it to be a lot. I want it to be something manageable. And when a company meets all the criteria of the FIDS and Fibers Qualified Splicer Program, they get to use the logo on their advertising, like their catalogs, their web pages. But every splice will have a FIDS and Fibers Qualified logo on it. And that will tell the end user that this company has uh, standardized labels. It has standardized recipes for all their intellectual capital, testing for all their stuff, training for all their people, insurance, um, quality control, tracing, and accountability via serial numbers uh, to, to bring that piece back to prove that it's good. Um, so this, I'm going to bounce back to here to finish up. I'm going to say evolution can be painful. And so if we take this path as, as we're evolving as an industry, back in the old days, we were a cottage industry. We were mom and pop. We were arborists. No one knew who we were. But now the, the investment companies have found us and they know that there's money to be made by owning these arborist supply shops. We're evolving. We're becoming more mainstream. We're becoming more professional. And that evolution, I don't want to be painful in the cost of human lives. We already lose enough people. Um, I don't want to have a scattershot approach because now I've got arborist supply companies in Canada and America and the South and the North and the West that call me and are asking me, how should I approach labels? How should I approach testing? How should I... And now I'm, I'm talking to them all piece by piece, one by one, giving them advice. Uh, but what I really want is I want to have them join on to the FIDS and Fibers Qualified Splicer program. That way we're all talking the same language. We're all doing the same thing. Um, they're basically going to be community guidelines. So let's take labels, for instance. Let's say that we have a, a minimum requirement for labels. They can exceed the minimum requirement. No problem. But uh, as far as the FIDS and Fibers Qualified Splicer Program, there'll be a minimum amount of information that needs to be there. And if we decide as a group that, oh, you know what, we need this, we'll add it. Or this needs to be changed, we'll change it. And we'll change it across the board. And then they can still have all their extra stuff on there, but there's a minimum amount that goes there. And that proves, with the FIDS and Fibers logo, that proves that this company is doing things using best management practices for splicing for life support in the arborist industry. So man, that's a mouthful. Uh, 
I know I talked a little fast. For those of you who are non-English speakers, I apologize. Um, and I also thank you all for taking the time to hang with me, to, to sit and listen to me blab about splicing. Um, I'm super jazzed about it. And please feel free to message me, text me, call me uh, in, you know, in person. I'd love to talk with you about it. Um, and I hope to sit on the ANSI committee and report to you back that we've made some positive changes. Uh, and I'm not going to give up on merging the European and the U.S. standard in the future. That's uh, one of my, my projects for the rest of my life. So as 2020 winds to a close, I hope you're being safe in the trees. I hope you're being safe with COVID and watching out for your loved ones. Please do a gear inspection and dedicate it to the fallen climbers of 2020. And uh, I hope to see you all soon in person instead of uh, virtually. So I'm gonna take the camera down, I'll walk you through the shop and we'll end up with back in the fire with uh, a view of the fire, just like we started. Let me take this off of here, I'll unplug that. There's the, the truck being worked on. I'm going back to work after we get off the phone here. And we're gonna be on the tools, as they say. And that's about 25 degrees here in New Hampshire. And it's just about time for some more wood in the old fire. Love to you all. Stay safe.